Thank you all. This is really a great honor and uh, a little overwhelming, actually, to hear your career summarized that way. Um, so thank you all. Thank you, Mark. Um, and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I see a lot of really distinguished economists in the audience. I uh, feel like I should say that I was told that this should be as non-technical as possible, and it will be. So uh, if you'd like to see equations or anything like that, we can talk at the reception. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a, a research agenda on child mental health as human capital. And in particular, I'm going to focus on the link between education, since we're all in the business of education, and child mental health. Uh, after talking a little bit about that link, then I'm going to turn to interventions. And I'm going to talk about four different types of interventions, supporting pregnant women, early childhood programs, improving mental health treatment, and lastly, uh, something which is not that well developed, but which I think is very important, is potentially working directly with schools. So this link between mental health and education, as, as Mark noted, is something that we worked on together um, for quite a while. A first question was just, well, if you have a bunch of young children with a, um, thank you, with a mental health screener, how predictive is that of their future outcomes? So we used Canadian data on four to 11 year old children and just asked the question, how do scores at time T predict educational outcome years later? Um, a, a key sort of feature here is that we were able to compare siblings with different scores on these mental health indicators in order to try and control for family background characteristics. And that was a, a step further than some of the previous evidence which had used cohort studies to look at longitudinal data. Uh, so for example, work in the UK using the National Child Development S Survey had shown that very early childhood mental health scores predicted education and earnings at, 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 at 23 and 33. I don't know, that may have made things worse. Uh, but we will soldier on here. Uh, there's also the uh, New Zealand Dunedin study, which has showed similar things. And then more recently, uh, Orazio Atanasio and his co-authors have looked at children born in the UK in two different cohorts and measured what they call non-cognitive skills. I'll come back to that definition. Um, showing that they're important predictors of adult outcomes, but also that they've become even more important over time. So they're more important now than they were for earlier cohorts. In any case, going back to this Canadian and US data, um, this is from those studies with Mark showing uh, different outcomes. So on your right, you have outcomes for the US. On the left, outcomes for Canada. Um, we have different types of mental health scores here for hyperactivity, anxiety, depression, antisocial behavior, and a sort of total score. And you can see that the tendency is that uh, children who had higher scores on these things uh, are more likely to repeat grades, they're less likely to still be in school when you get to age 16 to 19. They have lower math scores. They have lower reading scores. They're also more likely to be in special education. Okay, so this is a, a predictor, even within families, children that have higher scores on these indexes are likely to do worse. Using 
uh, administrative data from the Canadian province of Manitoba. We also looked at the effects of a broader range of child, out, uh, child health issues on child outcomes. And the aim here was to compare some common physical health problems, uh, especially asthma and injuries, which are the main reason why children end up getting hospitalized, to common mental health conditions in young children. And the main finding here, uh, again, using sibling comparisons, was that uh, the mental health measures had much uh, stronger effects than the physical health measures. So here you can see the estimated effect of measures at four different ages, and you can see um, that the effect of having ADHD or conduct disorders is much more negative than the effect of having asthma or even serious injuries. And uh, the outcome here was whether the children took courses in high school that were necessary to get into the public university system. So in this particular place, there's only public universities. To get into the public university, you have to take certain math courses in high school. If you don't take them, you can't go to college. And whether or not you took them depends on these mental health measures. Looking at a, another outcome, receipt of social assistance after age 18, again, you can see that the effect of these mental health problems was much greater than the effects of physical health problems. Okay. So this is just some work establishing that there is a link between educational outcomes and mental health. Uh, a second question, and, and maybe an even more important question, is, well, what could you do about it? And so I'm going to talk about four different kinds of interventions, uh, starting supporting pregnant women, early childhood programs, improving mental health treatment, and working with schools. I'm going to start with supporting pregnant women. Why is this important? Well, because there's this literature going back um, for a very long time in medicine and for a somewhat shorter time in economics showing that the effects of things that happen in utero can be very long-lived. Uh, and these could be shocks having to do with pollution exposure, nutritional deficits, maternal stress, uh, and so on. And a, an important thing that comes out of this research, I think, should be a shift away from a kind of classic paradigm in economics about nature versus nurture to thinking about the fact that both nature and nurture matter, right? We never see, well, almost never see things which are solely nature or solely nurture. It's always some sort of interaction effect. Just as an illustration of that, this is from a study that I did with Enrico Moretti looking at the relationship between birth weight in mothers and birth weight in children. So the birth weight of the mother here is along the x-axis, the birth weight of the child is along the y-axis, and so the flat part of the graph that you can see are mothers who were low birth weight, and um, the interesting thing, or what I'm trying to highlight here, is that if the mother was reasonably well off at the time that she gave birth to the child, that's the top line, the child's birth weight is higher regardless of what the mother's birth weight was. Okay, so there, there is a relationship between mother's birth weight and child's birth weight, but that relationship is mediated by the uh, socioeconomic status of the mother at the time of the birth. There's a lot of evidence that prenatal conditions can place children at higher risk of poor mental health. And some of the first evidence came from evidence linking the Dutch hunger winter to schizophrenia. That literature is, I think, especially interesting from this point of view of nature versus nurture because we know schizophrenia is very heritable. And yet, here is an environmental intervention that when uh, women were subjected to famine while the baby was in utero, the baby is more likely to end up actually having schizophrenia as an adult. <clears throat> 
Another example that's a little bit less dramatic than talking about famines and schizophrenia uh, is a study using Danish twins where they look at the relationship between the birth weight of the twins and whether the twins have ADHD. So with twins, they're almost always different birth weight just because of where they end up in the womb. And so uh, what the finding of this study was that the twin who was lower birth weight had a higher probability of being ADHD, even if they were identical twins. So you could take people who have identical genes, they're born at exactly the same time, and yet because of this uh, quirk of what happened when they are in the womb, are at higher risk to have uh, uh, mental illness. A third example is this paper by uh, Petra Pearson and Maya Rosen Slater, which uses Swedish administrative data and looks at the impact of having a death uh, of a close maternal relative while a baby is in utero. Now, there are previous studies that have looked at this question. The issue is that whether you have a death in the family is not a random thing. People who are of lower socioeconomic status are more likely to have a death in the family. So you have to somehow try and control for that. And the way that they do that is by comparing people who had a death in the family during the pregnancy to people who had a death in the family shortly after the pregnancy. Okay, so all of these are families who suffered a loss. The economic effect of that loss is probably similar across families. But if it happened while the baby was in utero, they find that there's a higher probability of using ADHD drugs in childhood and that if you follow these people to adulthood, you see a higher probability of using drugs for anxiety or depression. So again, it seems like there may be a, a relationship between what happens in utero to mental health later on. Now, thinking about can we actually do something about that, there is some evidence that's hopeful in that regard. Some of it goes back to this expansion of public health insurance coverage for pregnant women. Um, in 1996, with John Gruber, we did a paper showing that this very large increase in health insurance coverage from 12% of women uh, to about 42% of women had a big effect uh, in the short term on infant mortality, reducing it by 8.5%. Okay. Now, one nice thing about the fact that that happened a long time ago is that you can follow those cohorts up until the present, and um, these children who were born in the early 90s are now 20 or 30 years old. And so uh, a nice recent paper looking at the long-term effects of these expansions is by Laura... Uh, Sarah Miller and Laura Wary, and uh, one of their findings, which is the top row here, is that the children have better mental health scores as measured by this Kessler index. Okay, so it's about a 20% improvement in their mental health scores. You also see positive effects on other outcomes. There's a decrease in the probability that they use a um, welfare program called SNAP, an increase in the probability of college, an increase in income, and some very large um, increases in, or improvements in health as measured by reductions in hospital visits and chronic conditions. Some additional evidence comes from another prenatal program called the Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, or WIC. This is a program that provides food and medical care to low-income women during pregnancy. So we looked at children who were born between 2004 and 2009 and could be followed in public health insurance records up to age 6 to 11. Again, uh, compared siblings and found that covered children were less likely to have ADHD they were also less likely to have other mental health conditions that are diagnosed early in childhood. And these effects were bigger for black children and for more disadvantaged children. 
So that suggests that supporting pregnant women is actually a good long-term investment in children's mental health. Once children are born, we can also intervene through early childhood programs. Now, uh, there have been literally hundreds of studies at this point on early childhood programs, and um, this review that I'm highlighting here was in Nature Human Behavior, uh, focusing on the effect of early childhood interventions on what they also called non-cognitive skills. This term was originated in the 70s by Bulls and Gintas in a book about schooling in capitalist America. And uh, their basic point was that the literature on schools tended to focus on cognitive test scores and academic achievement, but that there are other things that are important for success in life besides cognitive test scores and academic achievement, and they called all of those other things non-cognitive scores. They did list some of them specifically, motivation, orientation to authority, internalization of work norms, discipline, temperament, and perseverance. Okay, so it's sort of a grab bag category, but it goes back uh, quite a ways in the literature. They looked at 554 studies, judged that 222 of them were of better quality, did a meta-analysis, and found generally positive effects on literacy, numeracy, academic school readiness, and also a measure of psychosocial school readiness. Okay, so this is all focusing on short-term effects. Of course, we want to know whether there are also long-term effects. Uh, I did one of the earlier studies on this, looking at the US Head Start program, which is an early childhood program for low-income children. And uh, we showed that there were positive effects. Here, uh, this is illustrating positive effects on the probability of attending college. The three bars here are showing first that the children who attended Head Start did worse than the other children. Okay. Now, that shouldn't be surprising because, first of all, you have to be poor to get into the program. And secondly, if there's any rationing, the program is required to take the neediest children. So you're getting the neediest of the neediest in this program, and in the long term, they do worse. The question is, did they do better or worse than they would have otherwise? And to see that, we compared children to their own siblings, which is the second bar. And when we do that, we see that participating in the Head Start program closed about a third of the gap between those children and the other children. We also saw that this effect was larger for white children than for other children. The reason for that, uh, we argued subsequently, was due to the fact that the other children tended to go to worse schools subsequently. Okay, so you can provide this preschool program. It does do a lot of good, but if you don't follow it up with subsequent adequate schooling, the uh, effects may fade. A more recent study looking at long-term effects of Head Start is the one by Martha Bailey et al. in the AER looking at the rollout of the US Head Start program using census data. Here, if you were five years old at the time that Head Start came to your county, you were not eligible, because five is the age cutoff. So you can see that children who are older than five, there's no effect. Okay? Kids who are younger than five could benefit from the program, but if you were negative five at the time that the program rolled out, uh, then you get the full benefit of the fully rolled out program, and you see that there's quite a large uh, effect on the probability of actually achieving college or more. Now, a question is, you know, what does this have to do with mental health? Are these long-term effects due to the effects of these programs on non-cognitive skills? 
it's reasonable to expect that they may be because we know that the effects on cognitive test scores tend to fade out over time. There are many studies showing that. And we also know that these externalizing behaviors tend to predict adult outcomes and behaviors. A nice paper by Jim Heckman and his co-authors looks at um, the Perry Preschool program, which had 123 disadvantaged minority students, estimates a factor model, finds one factor is more associated with externalizing behaviors, and, and provides this nice graph showing that indeed the kids who are in the treatment group have better behaviors um, in the sense of less externalizing behaviors and more academic motivation than the children who were in the control group. So this is some uh, direct evidence that these programs affect non-cognitive behaviors and that that might be one reason why they have long-term effects. A lot of these non-cognitive skills also are um, related to mental health. So uh, another example of that is a paper by Per Anders Eden and his co-authors documenting labor market returns to these non-cognitive skills using Swedish registry data on male draftees. All these draftees were tested for um, skills, including social maturity, focus, internal motivation, and stress tolerance. And what I want to highlight is how much those skills sort of map into common mental health disorders. So, you know, if you have autism spectrum disorder, you may lack social maturity. If you have ADHD, then your problem is focus. If you are very depressed, you may lack internal motivation. And if you have anxiety, that means you have difficulty with stress tolerance, right? So I want you to think about there being a spectrum with people at one end of the spectrum of these things having uh, more problems. You can also see the importance of these non-cognitive skills in the labor market by looking at data on why do people lose days of work. This is from the UK Labor Force Survey, which actually collects nice data on this. And you can see that the percent of days lost that are due to mental health is much greater than the next greatest category, which is musculoskeletal, things like lower back, back pain, uh, and then uh, all the other categories. Okay, so this is a very important economic uh, problem. So thinking about uh, this as a, as a problem, um, one of the things that it could be important to do is improving mental health treatment. This is something that I've been looking at um, for quite a while and uh, come to the conclusion that there's a lot of bad mental health treatment out there. One of the earlier studies of this uh, was with Mark and Lauren Jones looking at the, both the short and the longer term effects of expanding medication for ADHD. We used a natural experiment in the Canadian province of Quebec where they greatly expanded uh, insurance coverage for medications. We have a large sample of Canadian children that we were able to follow up over time. And importantly, all of these children were screened for ADHD symptoms and also asked about stimulant use. So just showing what this expansion looked like on the top uh, panel, I'm showing stimulant use in Quebec, which is the solid line, compared to the rest of Canada, which is the dashed line. And so you can see that where the program goes into effect, which is where the line is, you see a divergence where a lot more kids are getting medicated in Quebec. Um, that didn't seem to be the case with a lot of other medications. So in the bottom panel, we're showing ventilator use. The asthma is very common. Um, and it seems like there wasn't very much of a divergence there. So it encouraged a lot more kids to be put on stimulants. And then when we look at the effect of that by following the same child over time, before and after, we see that 
um, the effects on uh, the things that we were measuring were mostly negative. So we find a, a decline in the probability that they went without repeating grades. We see a big uh, effect in terms of whether they say that they're unhappy. And then in the longer term, when we look at them as young adults, we see they are less likely, slightly, to have completed high school, less likely to have done any post-secondary education, and more likely to report depression. So that's sobering. Um, why might there have been so many negative effects? One is that the care that was provided was probably not optimal. It's community care. Uh, a second thing is that the children who started stimulants after 1998 were not the children who had the highest level of symptoms. Those children were already being treated. So the marginal children here were children who had relatively low levels of symptoms but get treated with medication anyway. Uh, and this could have had negative effects by increasing stigma or the probability that they were in special education. And it's also possible that just if the child stops acting up in class, that they get ignored instead of um, getting additional resources to help them learn. And finally, it's possible that stimulants could actually uh, have effects on other mental health outcomes. It's important to note that there's a number of studies finding more positive effects on different domains, such as preventing injuries. So the papers that I've listed here all use a research design where they use variation in doctor prescribing patterns. It turns out that for most medications that you look at, there's some doctors who prescribe a lot more than others. So children who happen to see those doctors are going to be more likely to get medication. And these studies all find reductions in injury rates and reductions in other types of risky behavior. So the drugs are actually having an effect on, uh, on behaviors and outcomes, but just not on the educational outcomes. Okay, so what determines variation in whether children are diagnosed and treated? Uh, there are a lot of possibilities. One could be screening guidelines. You hope that doctors are going to follow them. Uh, and when the guidelines change, then maybe behavior would change. There's also changes in diagnostic criteria, changes in doctor behavior. Uh, and things like reimbursement methods could possibly matter. In a paper with Anna Chorney, we actually looked at the uh, reimbursement part of it and looked at the effect of switching to a capitated payment system in South Carolina's Medicaid program. So a capitated system means the doctor gets one payment, and for that one payment, they're supposed to provide all the care that you need. Now, that provides an incentive for under-treatment, so to ensure against that, the contract specified that the uh, insurers would be penalized if the doctors didn't do well-child screenings, and also said that the plants would be paid more if the child had a chronic condition. And what we see uh, when we look at uh, event studies is that the well-child screenings go up, and right along with that, the number of children being diagnosed with ADHD goes up. Okay, so if you screen more, you're going to find more. Looking at the same child before and after this change in the payment regime, you also see that the same child is more likely to be getting uh, well-child screenings, developmental screenings, even vaccinations just kind of shocking because they should have all been getting vaccinations. And looking at chronic conditions, they're more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD, they're more likely to be diagnosed with depression, but they're also more likely to be diagnosed with physical health conditions. Okay, so the effect of uh, screening more can be pretty profound in terms of the number of, um, or the incidence of conditions. Another example of that that I've been working on recently is looking at trends 
in suicide-related behaviors. So this is using data from New Jersey on all teens who showed up at a hospital and were diagnosed with some sort of suicide-related behavior. And so what you can see is that the suicide deaths over the period that we're looking at are flat. They're a bit noisy because New Jersey's kind of small. So the brown line here is showing suicide deaths in the entire Northeast region, also kind of flat. But the blue line there is showing the suicide-related hospital visits. Okay, so the outcome is staying relatively the same, but the number of people being diagnosed is going up. Now, why is that? Uh, two possibilities that I've indicated here with the vertical lines are that in 2011, a new guideline came out saying that all girls should be screened for depression. And you see an uptick there. And then in 2016, a guideline came out and said that you should always code suicidal ideation as a secondary diagnosis if it is present. And that was a new instruction for clinicians. Okay, so looking at the first thing, the screening thing, what you see here is if I look by gender, that uptick in 2011 is only for girls and not for boys. So it directly coincides with this guideline that you should start screening for depression. If you screen for depression, part of that is that you ask about suicidal ideation. So they start screening people and they find more. Okay, and then looking at uh, breaking down the suicide-related behaviors, what you can see is that most of the increase in suicidal behaviors being recorded is from suicidal ideation, and it occurs after they start telling clinicians to code suicidal ideation. Okay, so in a way, this is a very dark topic, but in a way, I think this is actually good news and, and not bad news in the sense it's saying at least some of this trend in increasing suicidal behaviors is because people are paying attention and screening and coding things that they weren't asking about before. Okay, so um, conditional on diagnosis, there is a wide variation in mental health treatment. So some of the work I've been doing recently is looking at mental health treatment and outcomes in children who all have private health insurance coverage. So differences here are not because some children are insured and some children aren't. We look at the first mental health episode, which is a useful thing that you can do with children if you're following them over time. And oh, in this sample, we find that about 10% of the kids have some kind of mental health episode, which is a fairly typical number. Okay. So the first thing that we see is that there's a lot of kids who don't get any treatment. So this 29.4% is, you know, you get some diagnosis and then after three months you're still not getting any treatment. Uh, so that is one of the uh, margins to be concerned about. You can also see that there's a, a lot of people who are getting treated only with drugs and no therapy, which is also concerning. Um, so there's altogether uh, less than 50% that are getting uh, therapy. Okay. And then if we focus on the people who are getting drug treatments, uh, another thing about children is that it's fairly clear what sort of treatment is uh, appropriate and which sort of treatment is inappropriate. So I focused here on uh, four types of treatment that are kind of inappropriate. Um, the first is whether they get benzodiazepines. So you keep in mind, these are like 12-year-olds who are getting treated for the first time. This is an addictive drug and also one that's dangerous, but 15% are getting that. 13% uh, are getting a drug that it hasn't been FDA approved for use in children. Um, a smaller share are getting these older tricyclic antidepressants, which again are not uh, advised for children. And then 13% of them are actually getting multiple drugs, even though it's the first time that they've ever been treated. So on the whole, uh, uh, you know, almost half of the treatment is clearly inappropriate 
that these children are getting. Uh, another way to look at variation is just looking at a map. So this is a map of antidepressant drug use uh, across the US. All the little squares here are counties. And the color coding is such that the darkest uh, amounts to almost one prescription per child per year in the county, whereas the lightest is zero. So you're going from zero to, to one per child, depending on where you are. And so um, looking at this variation in treatment and what the consequence is, we uh, do the same thing where we're looking at the first uh, time that somebody was ever treated. We look at the variation in treatment using provider supply and also provider practice styles, so basically whether people prescribe a lot or not, as uh, instrumental variables to try and explain the variation in treatment. And uh, this uh, tree diagram is showing what we find. Here the outcome is self-harm, so whether the child has hurt themselves after 24 months, and what you see is that um, if they use drugs during treatment, it's actually slightly less likely to have harmed themselves, but it depends a lot on what kind of drug that they use. So here, what I'm calling the red flag drugs are those ones that I called out in the pie chart as being clearly inappropriate. And then uh, you also have the FDA-approved drugs for that condition. And so you see the probability that the child uh, self-harms is lower if they were prescribed an FDA-approved drug than if they were prescribed one of these red flag drugs. And actually it's lower with the FDA-approved drugs than if they got no drugs, i.e. if they only had therapy. So the last thing I want to talk about is what the implications of this might be for working with schools. And um, I think the important thing to recognize here is that school is a very difficult environment for some children. So um, a nice paper that I want to highlight is this paper by Chandler that looks at German data, takes advantage of different holiday schedules in different parts of Germany, and finds that school holidays cause a 16% decrease in the probability of youth suicide, and also that suicides spike in the first two days following the end of the school holidays. So it turns out this is actually not only in Germany, it's in many other countries as well. This is showing data for the US, and so the suicide rate for 12 to 18 year olds is the solid black line. You can see that it goes way down in July, which is summer holidays. Then it goes up in October, and then it goes down again at the Christmas holidays. The dashed line here is for the next oldest age group, 19 to 25, and you see no seasonal pattern for them at all. Okay, so this is very suggestive that it's something about school. This paper by Hansen, Sabi, and Schaller has a hypothesis, which is that this has to do with bullying in school. And so they, they show this evidence. Um, this is a very interesting thing to have done. Here, the red line is looking at uh, school foot traffic using cell phone data. So using cell phones, they can see what days there were a lot of people at the school. And uh, they're doing this during COVID, as you can see. And there was a lot of variation across the US and whether schools were open or not. All the local school boards were doing their own thing and deciding when it would be open and when it would be closed. So the red line goes up and down, depending on whether there were school closures or not. And then the gray line shows Google searches on uh, child bullying. Okay? And you can see how closely the red line and the gray line are following each other. Um, you can also see the 
very dark gray bar is the first shutdown in March 2020, and then the uh, lighter gray bars are showing summer holidays. Okay, so again, you can see this clear decline in uh, searches related to bullying during the summer holidays and then peaks uh, at times when the school is open. You can also see this kind of thing in, in other contexts. This is from some work that I'm doing looking at the relationship of, the, uh, of schools and uh, specifically sort of high stressful points at school entry and at uh, exam dates in Taiwan. Uh, so here, what we've done is to look at children who were born in August and children who were born in September, where the school starting date is September 1. So if you're born in August, you can go to school on September 1, and you're always going to be the youngest in the class. If you're born in September, you can't go to school until the next year, and you're always going to be the oldest in the class. Okay? So what you see looking at the red line for the August born is that as soon as they go to school, there's this increase in getting diagnosed for ADHD. And then for the September born, the same, there is an increase that occurs a year later. Okay? So the red line is always above the blue line. So there's a disadvantage to being the youngest in your class. Uh, but the time series pattern shows this increase on school entry. Then you can look at what happens uh, after they write these exams that you have to write in Taiwan to get into high school. Okay? And so you see that the medication for ADHD falls for the August-born cohort uh, and then falls a year later for the September-born cohort, after this stressful event of having to write these exams is resolved. So I think there could be a lot more to do with um, thinking about how schools and maybe stressful events associated with schooling uh, play into these youth mental health problems. Okay. So just kind of in summary, I think there's been a tendency to think about child health as something separate from the whole schooling process. It's something that maybe affects adult health and then has an effect on adult outcomes. But I think that's not really the right model. The right model is one where there's a very clear relationship between education and child mental health. It goes both ways. And so, uh, saying what kind of interventions can improve children's mental health and educational outcomes, well, all of the above, I think, are important. Thinking about supporting pregnant women, early childhood programs, improving mental health treatment, and working with schools. Um, I often get asked if I say something like this, and I was like, okay, fine, but which one is the most important one, and which one should we spend money on? And I just want to push back a little bit about that. I'm going to show you a picture from a paper by uh, Hendren and Sprungkaiser, where they looked at uh, more than 130 different US programs and tried to calculate a marginal value of public funds for all of these programs. Uh, the marginal value of public funds means you try and measure the social benefit and uh, look at that relative to the cost to government and say, is this program producing more social benefit than the cost? Okay. And so the circle is for all the child programs, and the straight line that's about one is for all the other programs. Okay. So basically what they're saying is that most of these child programs that they evaluated um, using credible experimental and quasi-experimental methods, find uh, marginal values of public funds that are higher than the cost of the program. Okay. So in other words, we're underspending on these programs. We're leaving money on the table in the sense that we could be producing a lot more value uh, and 
you know, so I, I would just say that we probably should be spending a lot more on children than we are and not thinking about it in terms of like, well, which program for children should we spend money on? Okay, so in conclusion, I hope that I've convinced you that child mental health is important to educational attainment and also that the school environment may be very important for mental health. I think efforts to improve mental health can address children's prenatal, early childhood, and healthcare environment, and that building on this foundation, schools may be able to also act to improve mental health and education outcomes. So thank you all for uh, listening, and um, th thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure uh, we would all like to continue this discussion because this was absolutely fascinating and it raises so many uh, issues. Uh, we haven't planned a Q&A here, but you are all invited uh, to continue the, the discussion at the reception uh, next door in the Zenatza. So thanks for a fascinating lecture. It was absolutely marvelous. Uh, and uh, please join us for the reception and have a nice evening. Thank you, Janet. <laughs>